The Earth rotates to the east. Again, if you stare at the top of the planet, you're staring directly at the North Pole, you'll see counterclockwise rotation. To put another way, it's rotating to the east. This is why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west instead of the other way around. What that's going to do is as there's an initiation of a flow of air, for example, from the North Pole southwards, rather than moving in a straight perpendicular line, or I'm sorry, in a straight line, that straight line as it moves further and further down is going to be left behind by the turning earth. So as the world moves to the east or as it moves counterclockwise like that, it's moving in front of that moving air. So it's going to appear as if that wind is veering to the right. The faster rotating surface moves it ahead or uh, the surface moves ahead as the wind blows behind it. So any wind that's initiated is going to have a rightward veer to it in the northern hemisphere and a leftward veer to it in the southern hemisphere. We're going to forget about the southern hemisphere, right? This is this is the FAA private pilot. We're in the United States, so we don't have to feel too bad about leaving out our friends in the southern hemisphere when we only talk about the effects of Coriolis effect and things like that from the perspective of us in the northern hemisphere. So we'll keep it simple from the rest of the course and only talk about wind veering to the right as the initiating pressure gradient is deflected by the Coriolis effect. What it boils down to is that you have two forces that are causing the wind to blow. You have an initiating force, that's the pressure gradient force that starts the air moving from high to low, and we can think of that as moving perpendicular to isobar. So you see the uh, five isobars that we have spaced here is those horizontal lines and that red arrow that's moving perpendicular to it that's not being affected by the Coriolis that's that initiating force but then a Coriolis effect is going to deflect it to the right and that's that blue arrow there so as that takes effect you notice that the perceived wind direction is going to veer off to the right of what the pure pressure gradient force looks like. So now as this continues, we can see the effect that Coriolis has as that wind continues on. And so once Coriolis has taken its full effect, it's taken that wind that was initially moving across the isobars and it's now causing it to seem to move parallel with the isobars. And notice the phenomenon, right? Pressure gradient force is now being counterbalanced by Coriolis force. And when those two forces are in direct opposition, you have the observed wind direction flowing parallel to those isobars. Notice another thing here. Because it's veering to the right as it moves from high to low, it's causing the wind to have the high pressure system or the high pressure air to the right of it and the low pressure system of air to the left of it. That's going to be really important in determining the direction of airflow in a low pressure system and a high pressure system. And you can see kind of where we're getting at. If you have a high pressure system, it means that the wind is always going to be blowing to that side of it that makes the high pressure on its right. right? As you get closer and closer and closer to the high pressure system, you're observing the wind off to that side. Same thing in the low pressure. So we'll see how that kind of plays out when we create these systems. But in the northern hemisphere, the high pressure is to the right of the wind and the low pressure is to the left of the wind. So keeping that model of low pressure to the left of wind, high pressure to the right of wind, if we take these isobars and we turn them in on each other, right? They were parallel lines before and now we're curving them in on each other, which is the tendency that they have to do, you can see the direction of travel of the air. In a low pressure system like the one up top, air is going to be flowing counterclockwise. And you notice that as it does that, it stays consistent with that rule that the low pressure is always to the left of the wind, whether it's moving on the bottom or the top of that oval as you're looking at it. And conversely, in the high pressure system, you have clockwise rotation of air keeping the high pressure to the right of that wind. In weather terms, we talk about counterclockwise and clockwise motion as being cyclonic or anti-cyclonic. The, the way you can keep this straight in your head is that a cyclone is a low pressure system. A hurricane is a low pressure system. Those move counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. So cyclonic activity is around a low pressure system counterclockwise and 
anticyclonic is clockwise. Now that we know the direction of travel of wind in a high pressure and a low pressure system, we can make an interesting observation is that as you fly towards the center of a low pressure system, you're going to perceive the winds from coming off of your left side. And notice that that holds true whether you approach from the north, the south, the east, or the west of the system. Because the winds are flowing counterclockwise in that low pressure system, if you're flying inbound, you're perceiving the wind off of your left side. And by that same token, if you fly inbound towards a high pressure system, you're perceiving the winds to be off of your right side, regardless of how you're approaching from north, south, east, or west. So you can determine the type of winds that you would expect based on what you're flying into. And by the same token, if you know that you're flying towards the center of a system, you can tell what that system is based on the direction of the wind. Now there's one more complication to this. So we talked about the pressure gradient force. We talked about that initiating force, what causes the wind to start blowing. And we talked about Coriolis force, what causes the wind to curve. There's another complicating factor here. And that's the fact that as you get close to the surface, the air that moves across it is going to be deflected or it's going to be affected by that wind. The pressure gradient doesn't change whether you're talking about being close to the surface or high up above the surface it's just a function of how different are the pressure systems and how close together are they but what does get affected is the Coriolis force as you get close to the surface the friction that slows down moving air because of things like trees or buildings or rugged terrain or anything jagged on the surface of the earth that gets in the way or that slows down that Coriolis force is going to have another veering effect on the wind. So if we start with that simple model from a few slides ago, we take kind of the end state of the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force and that first third of the slide here where you have counterbalancing pressure gradient force and Coriolis force which causes a wind direction which goes exactly parallel with an isobar in other words it splits right down the middle between a low pressure and a high pressure system well now if you add surface friction you're slowing the wind down you're not slowing the force of the wind down but you're slowing the actual wind speed down if the wind speed goes slower, as you see in that second half or that second third of the slide, that means that the Coriolis effect isn't going to have as great of an effect on the wind, right? The faster the wind flies, the more the spinning of the earth is going to cause it to deflect. So a slower wind speed means a smaller Coriolis force. A smaller Coriolis force means the pressure gradient starts to win out again. So that's going to cause the wind to change direction, that it's going to veer again, and it's going to veer away from a high pressure system, and it's going to veer inwards towards a low pressure system. So these are the three factors into how fast is the wind blowing and what direction is the wind going to come from. And you see it all right there in that third panel of this slide here. It's pressure gradient force that causes the wind to blow. It's Coriolis force, which causes the wind to veer. And then it's surface friction, which slows down or retards the Coriolis force. Those are the three forces which determine wind speed and direction. And when they're all used in balance like this, what you have is wind that's off a little bit of skew, and it skews away from a high pressure system and towards a low pressure system. Here's what that looks like on our pressure map. So again, you have that high pressure system with clockwise moving air and low pressure system with counterclockwise moving air but you notice that the wind is veering outside the system in the high pressure area and it's veering inside in the low pressure area. So this is the net result of those three forces, the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis, and surface friction. Now obviously this is going to change depending on how close to the surface you are. The closer the surface you are, the greater the surface friction, the more of that veering across the isobars that you're going to get. If you're high above the surface and there's not as much friction, you will start to see air that moves more in line or more parallel with those isobars. And obviously there's always going to be a little bit of a mixing between those two. And the mixing between those two is just because air is also moving up and down over the course of the day. 
yeah, that that may not be the case at times like at nighttime, especially if you have a temperature inversion like we talked about and it's strong enough to make a very firm layer between the top air and the bottom air. Well, what that'll do is that will cut down or minimize the amount of mixing so that there will be a drastic change in the wind speed and direction as you climb up above a certain altitude close to the surface. See, you do see that at nighttime. I mean, generally speaking, the winds do tend to die down at nighttime. Even though up aloft they may be blowing 20 knots or whatever they were blowing uh, over the course of the day, you won't experience that unless you actually start to climb up one or 2,000 feet.